Amen. Amen. Well, I, I was thinking about this message, and uh, the Lord gave me a very interesting analogy that I'm going to use to kind of set the stage for, for all of this, uh, for what the Lord has to say through me today. But I can recall times in, in my life uh, and in the lives of my children when uh, either I gave them something new or they received something new. Maybe it was at a birthday or maybe it was at Christmas and uh, they got it and they get it out of the package and they're sitting over there to the side and they're, they're trying to make this thing work, but they're not, not really figuring it out. <laughs> uh, you know, they're trying to do it. And uh, basically what they end up doing is making it work the way they want it to work. But uh, eventually that gets so frustrating that they'll come up to me and they'll say, Daddy, would you please show me how this thing works? I'm sure you dads and maybe you moms have had that uh, an experience similar uh, to that with your own children. But... As we have talked for several weeks now, God has blessed us with something new. God has blessed us with this new covenant. He has privileged us, uh, giving us the opportunity to live under the new covenant. Bought and paid for, the gift bought and paid for by his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. God is giving us, giving us something new. And as I've said before, it, it comes with batteries. In other words, it comes with the resource that's needed to make it work, okay, which is his life. And we've talked a lot uh, about that, okay. Uh, but the reality is, whether you want to agree with this or not, based on 15 years of ministry and my own experience, okay, we try to make this thing work in the way that we think it ought to work, you know? And because that's the case, we're not experiencing how God intended for Christianity to work, for this new covenant to work in our lives. And what I'm essentially saying is I think the greatest need for us at this point in our life as a church, as a congregation of the Lord, as children of the Lord, is to set aside what we think and begin to hear and accept what God thinks. Amen? It's time to set aside how we think it ought to work and how we think it's supposed to work and all those different things. Essentially repent and begin to see things as God sees it. In other words, cry out, Daddy... Father, will you please show me how this thing works? Because when it works, ladies and gentlemen, there is, whoa. Watch out, ladies. It's coming for you. So, I don't know what that bee's doing. It's about to be caught somewhere. Stomp it, Belinda. Stomp it. Kill it. There you go. Oh. Watch out. Okay. So just keep your eyes open, all right? I know it's hard to do two things at one time, but keep your eyes open for the wasp and listen at the same time, okay? But I really believe that's one of our greatest needs. It's something I've had to do in my own life. Over the years, I've honestly, whether I realized it or not, had to say, okay, God, I've tried long enough, and what I'm doing, what I'm thinking is not working. It's not producing the kind of Christianity that I read about in the book of Acts, guys. I mean, come on, let's be realist. God hasn't changed, okay? Just because times have changed and the culture's changed doesn't mean God has changed what he's producing in this world, okay? So I've had to do this and I really believe it's probably one of the greatest needs that we have to set aside what we think and say, all right, God, I want to see it how you see it and get the help we need from him. Because when it works, the life of Jesus Christ will be manifested in the world. Okay? I'm afraid that we have taken, taken something that was intended to be an every moment experience of his life 
and we've turned it into a one or two hour event that happens in a specific place. Let me just say that again. We've taken something that God intended to be in every moment experience of his life on the inside of us living through us and we've turned it into a one or two hour event that happens in a place. That's where you're supposed to say, okay, I agree. Well, you may not agree. I don't know. But we've done that. We are truly, and, and listen to me on this, we have truly become a people who go to church. I'm sorry, but we have become a people who go to church. Now, you and I both know that you don't go to church, right? Because you are the church of Jesus Christ. You know that, but I say it still, you say it still, not beating anybody up about that, but the problem with it is is that when we become a people who just go to church, Church, let me ask you, what in the world are we producing? What are we supposed to be producing? Let me ask you this, why in the world should it be anything less than what Jesus produced in the book of Acts? And when I say the book of Acts, all I'm saying is people whom we see and read about through whom Jesus is just continuing his life. I'm afraid that we are a far cry from the the kind of Christianity that we see in the book of Acts. Just read it. What you find there are individuals who consider spreading the good news as being more important than their own life. That's what we're talking about when we talk about the, the Christianity of the book of Acts. But we're living in a day and time where it's accepted to say, well, I just can't talk about this here and in this place. And in, that's not what they were thinking. And trust me, they lived in a culture where their lives were on the line. Something way more important than your job or, or, or your name, or whatever it is, okay? I, I'm just saying, where's that at? Where, where's, where's the desire to spread the gospel being greater than our own lives? Because that's the kind of Christianity we see produced in the book of Acts. And God doesn't change. And I don't know about you, but I'm just, in my mind, I'm just saying, God, okay, that's, that's what I want to be. I don't want to miss it, and that's what I want to lead other people to be. But when is the church going to humbly say that? When are we going to realize we've just become a people who go to church instead of truly being at the church, being, excuse me, being the church every moment that we live? and enjoying what he created us. When I read the book of Acts, we see Christians. Do you know what the word Christian means? It means little Christ. As a matter of fact, it's interesting how the church got the name Christian. It wasn't something that they got all of them together and decided, hey, what are we going to call ourselves? Okay, you say this, you say that, and then then everybody votes, and so Christian got, it won the vote, and so everybody said, this is what we're going to call it. That's not how it happened. Do you know how they got the name Christian? It was the name the world gave them. As a matter of fact, I can't remember what chapter in Acts. You can look it up, but it says, and they were first called Christians in Antioch. And that was the name they received by the world because the world looked at these people and said, they're little Christ running around everywhere. Why was that? Because they were seeing the life of Christ being manifested through their life. But this is not happening today on a large scale. It's just not. So let me use this illustration that I gave you at the beginning, and I want to give you several points. Write these down. Here's the first point. And it's somewhat of a little review, but uh, there's some things here that the Lord has shown me that will help you. Number one is the point that the batteries are included, okay? The batteries are included. All right, son, I'm going to help you figure out how this thing works. All right? So the first thing you've got to do, let's get this thing out here. And you see these little things over here that you've kind of pushed to the side that you don't deem important because they're not fun to play with. They are actually really important to making this thing work. So what we got to do, we got to take these batteries and we're going to put them in this little compartment right here, okay? So we get the batteries out, we put them in there, all right? So that's, that's the first step, right? 
The thing that I want to tell you, church, is that you have the Spirit. If you are a child of God, you have God's life. Amen? The batteries are included. Once you believe, the Bible teaches that His life comes inside of you. Now, why is this so important? Because there are some who deem it necessary to teach you that you don't receive the Spirit until a later moment after you get saved. There are some people that are trying to teach the idea that maybe you've got the Spirit, but you've got to get some sort of second blessing in order to really get the fullness of God's Spirit working in your life, okay? But I'm here to tell you, and I pray you hear, and I pray your heart embraces the reality that if you are a child of God, the batteries are included. You have God's life in you. Listen to these verses, okay? And you know how I am. I'm just all over the place. But Romans chapter 8, verse 11. Romans chapter 8, verse number 11. It says this, But if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. Now who's He talking about? Who's the you? It's the church. It's the people of God. He's not saying wait to receive something later. He's not inferring to some sort of second blessing. He's saying, listen, the spirit that you need to give life to your mortal body is on the inside of you. You've got it. You have everything that pertains to life and godliness, Peter says. And it's his life. It's, it's on the inside. It's funny how in the book of Corinthians, if you've ever studied 1 and 2 Corinthians, you understand what a difficult time this church was having. The reason they're, they're, they were facing such difficulty is that they were choosing to live by the flesh rather than to live by the Spirit. And so that's why Paul over and over and over, the Spirit of God is stressing the reality that you guys are the temple of God who lives in you. He says it in 1 Corinthians 3. He says it in 1 Corinthians 6. He says it again in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. I mean, he continues to remind these people. He continues to tell the church, look, the living God's inside of you. Stop being controlled by your flesh. And let the Spirit of God control you. So the batteries are included, ladies and gentlemen. In the beginning, and I'm just going to, this is a brief review. But in the beginning, the plan of God was to reveal himself through mankind. That's what it meant when God said, I'm creating you in my own likeness, in my own image. The image of God is God himself. God created man to reveal himself. God created man to live his life. Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. You know that verse, God took the dirt, the dust of the ground, he fashioned it into what looked like a man, and then what did he do? He breathed life into that man. And man became a living being, but he breathed into him that life. And so Adam and Eve enjoyed his life. They lived his life until Genesis 3, right? And in Genesis chapter 3, what happened? They died. But it's interesting that they did not die physically at that moment. But what did happen is that they died spiritually. So you've got life, then you've got death, and then you've got the Bible teaching us in Genesis chapter 5 that Adam has Seth, who was now created in whose likeness and image. Not God's, but in Adam's. So the idea, listen, I boldly say this, the idea that we're all created in the image of God is a lie. We're not created in the image of God. We're created in the image of Adam. In other words, what does that mean? We are created spiritually dead, and there's a whole lot of evidence in the Bible to prove that. Matter of fact, Ephesians 2, go home and read it. Paul says, hey, before you were saved, you were dead in your trespasses and sins. 
So when God looks at humanity, what he sees is that the greatest need is not just to be forgiven, but he sees that the greatest need is for the dead to be raised to life. And ladies and gentlemen, when we are engaged in his life and his mission, his mission in this world, the result is that we will pray without ceasing because we realize that we're engaged in something that is beyond ourselves. We're engaged in something where the dead are coming to life. And ladies and gentlemen, I don't have the ability to bring the dead to life. But God does. And so when I'm engaged in that and I understand this is the purpose, this is the mission, man, I'm always praying. That's why I invited you this morning to come and pray and just to think about those people. Because listen, if God doesn't do it, it's not going to happen. But in the beginning there was life. God breathes into man, but then there's death. And that death, according to Romans chapter 5, has been passed on to all men. We've all been created in the image and likeness of Adam. We're spiritually dead. But aren't you grateful that we have the opportunity to begin again? Amen? Come on, guys. That's the beauty of it. We're born into this life spiritually dead, but we, through Christ, through faith in Christ, have the opportunity to be raised up to a new life. In Galatians chapter 3, I, I don't really have time to go into all of this, but Paul saw the blessing, the promise of the blessing to Abraham in you, Abraham. The nations, the entire world is going to be blessed. Paul in Galatians 3 was seeing this promise as the promise of the Spirit, ladies and gentlemen. Paul was seeing it as that. And so he was saying the gospel was preached beforehand to, Paul, uh, to, to Abraham. Was yes, man is spiritually dead. And as a result, he's going to be selfish. He's always going to do things towards his own advantage. That's the way it's going to be. But I'm telling you, I'm promising you a new life through the Spirit. This was the ultimate blessing. Ezekiel 36, if we've read many times, God says, I will put my Spirit in you. I will put my spirit. I'm going to put my life in you. Now, I want you to look at John chapter 20. You just got to read this verse with me. John chapter number 20, verse 22. The context is a resurrected Lord with his disciples and Verse 21 or 20, he shows them his hands, his side. The disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them, verse 21, Peace to you, as the Father has sent me, I also send you. Isn't it interesting that as soon as the disciples understand and they get it, and they realize who Jesus is, man, the first thing right here is your commission. See, God doesn't give grace. Now, you guys need to hear this. You need to hear your pastor say this because I'm telling you, this is, this is something that people un misunderstand about me. Oh, I hear it all the time. God does not give grace so that you can just go out here and just live however you want to live. God gives you grace for an assignment, okay? God gives you grace for an assignment. In other words, he's blessed you with grace so that now you can take what you've been given and consume your life with giving it to others. Are you with me? And listen, when you're consumed with giving grace to others, let me tell you something. Your flesh takes a back seat, okay? I mean, you want to you wanna deal with sin in your life? Get focused on the world. Get consumed with God's mission to the world, with God's purpose for the world. And I'm telling you, this other stuff that you struggle with, you won't have time to fool with it. And that's the way it was intended to work. Not by you sitting around going, I don't want to sin today. But that's what we do, isn't it? It's like a buddy of mine told me, he said, you know, people get saved and they spend the rest of their life trying to keep themselves saved. 
God cleans a person. God cleans them. He makes them clean, and then they spend the rest of their life trying to keep themselves clean. No wonder Peter says the reason people are not fruitful is because they forget that they've already been clean. Because when you forget you've already been clean, you'll spend the rest of your life trying to clean yourself. You're clean in Christ. You say, well, preacher, I'm telling you, if you tell people that, they're just going to go do whatever they want. That's their choice. Matter of fact, they don't need grace to go do whatever they want. They're already doing it. But what I want people to see is that there's a world out here that God wants to turn you out to. That he wants you to be light to and salt to. Not to use your freedom as an opportunity to just gratify your flesh. Y'all get it, amen, right? You see that. With grace, there is an assignment. A life. It's bigger than a building. It's bigger than an hour. It's bigger than two hours. It's a life. It's everywhere. Everywhere that you are, it's bigger than a program. You understand that. John chapter 20. No way I'm getting done today. Look at this. Verse 22. This is awesome. You remember what happened in the beginning? Genesis chapter 2 verse 7. God fashions a man from the dust of the ground and he breathes into him the breath of life. Then in chapter 3, man dies spiritually. That spiritual death through Adam has been passed on to all men. Read Romans 5. Read Genesis 5. Seth created in the image likeness of Adam, not the image and likeness of God. His spiritual death has been passed on to all of us. But in the last Adam, in Jesus, we can, be, we can all be made alive. And here it is. And when he had said this, he, he what? Whoa. God's breathing again. God's breathing again, amen? When he, when he breathed the first time, man came to life, amen? And if you're here today with me and God's breathed on you, you know that when God breathes, man comes to life. And that's what's happening. We can begin again because God, through faith, because of his amazing grace, is willing to once again breathe his life into mankind. Amen? He's willing to do that. And something that I tried and found was impossible now with his life. Now with the life of the one who was tested and tempted in every way, and yet he stood the test. That's the same life living in the body of Christ. As a child of God, you have the resource needed to live the Christian life. And hey, if you're here today and you're struggling, you say, man, I don't know if I'm saved or not. Hey, you can be born again. You can be born again through faith in Christ, and you can receive the gift of God's Holy Spirit. And he will breathe upon you and give you that resource. Secondly, real quick, not only are the batteries included, but the power switch all right, now here's the deal. You've got your kid there, and you help them get the batteries installed and all that's ready to go. The next step then is to say, all right, you, you see this little button on the side? It says off, and it says on. All right, now it's on off. When you push it to on, here you go. <laughs> now it's going to work. Now it's going to do what it was intended to do, Right? One of the most important statements that I've ever learned in my life was from John chapter 15, verse 5, and I want you to hear me out. One of the most important statements I ever learned in my Christian life is from John chapter 15, verse 5, where Jesus says, speaking to his disciples, he says, without me, you can do nothing. And in the Greek language, it's interesting because in English, you, 
We don't, I don't know how to say one. I say them all the time. I use double negatives all the time, but I can't figure out one to say right now. But anyway, in the original Greek, if you look at that sentence, literally there's, there's, it's a double negative. In other words, you say, what does that mean, Pastor? What it means is God is emphasizing something. Pay attention to this. Because I'm saying, no, not, never. Is it ever going to happen that you're going to do anything without me? One of the most important statements that I ever learned in my Christian life. And he says that in the context of giving his disciples the analogy of the vine and the branch. Are you with me? I mean, think about it. That branch is never going to produce fruit without the life of the vine. It's never going to happen. I mean, you can do a lot of things, but without God's life, whose life are you going to be living? Your life. I'm going to tell you something. Your life, don't cut it. The Bible says Jesus came to die, and not only did he die our death, but the Bible says we literally died with him. So that's what he thinks of my life. Yeah, just kill Matt. <laughs> What God's saying, I just need to get Matt out of the way. Matt's wrecking himself. I just need to get Matt out of the way. I'm coming in, and I want to live through him. Are you with me? That's what he's saying. That's the beauty of the new. God said, I'm coming in. <laughs> You're not responding with me on the outside, giving you all these do's and don'ts. That's not working, but I'm coming in, and I'm literally going to cause you to walk in my ways. Now, guys, for me, that changes everything. Because I know without God's life, people can't live his life. And so that's why, I mean, I'm not going to beat people up with the law when they're lost. I mean, the reason I'm going to use the law is to help them see they need Jesus. I'm not going to beat them up with the law and expect them to do something they'll never be able to do in their own ability. But I will use the law and use it properly to help people see that you deserve death and that you need a Savior. Listen to these few verses. Start in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. Just to kind of help you see biblically what I'm, what I'm trying to say, guys. This is not me, my opinion, just some crazy guy that's just fell, fallen off the deep end. But Galatians chapter 2, 20, Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. What happened to you, Paul? Well, I died. I realized what God thought about Paul. He killed me. I realize what God thought about my life. He killed it. So let me ask you something then. Is, I mean, would you think in any way that the Christian life would be about you living your life or doing the best that you can or getting up and striving as hard? No, absolutely not. Paul says, I recognize that I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. But it's Christ who lives in me. Did you hear that? I'm living, but it's Christ who's living in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith. Now Paul's telling you how he lives the Christ life. By what? There's the power switch. Are you with me? There's the power switch. The just shall live by faith. And just in case you didn't get it the first time, God repeats it several times. That's the power switch. The Christian life becomes a response to God's life in me. As I hear him speaking, okay, as I hear God prompting me and leading me in different ways, my life now becomes a response of faith to do what he's telling me to do. Galatians, or excuse me, Romans chapter 5. Go back with me. Let's look at this one. Chapter 5, verse 10. This is an interesting verse. For when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. Much more having been reconciled, okay? Now that you have the relationship, notice what it says. We, the people of God, shall be saved by his life.
Now, it's important to understand the order of that text because he's already talking about the fact that we've been reconciled. Now, as believers, now as those who have been reconciled, every day, guess what? We are going to be saved by his life. So what is my hope? It's his life in me. What is my hope to live it? It's his life in me. Talk about that one more later. Last one today, Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, and again, we'll, we'll just wrap this up next week, but Ephesians chapter 5. Listen to these words that Paul uses. Start at verse 14. Ephesians 5, 14. Therefore he says, awake you who sleep. Arise from the dead and Christ will give you life or light. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools but as wise. Redeeming the time because the days are evil. Therefore do not be unwise but understand what the will of the Lord is. And now look at verse 18. And do not be drunk with wine in which is dissipation, but rather be, be filled with the Spirit. Are you with me? Now remember, Paul is writing a letter to the people of God, to the church at Ephesus. And he's saying, hey guys, see that you walk circumspectly. Redeem the time. Don't be unwise, but be wise. Understand what the will of the Lord is. Don't be drunk with wine, in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. When you look at the book of Acts, you'll, you'll see this idea mentioned several times. The idea of an individual being filled with the Spirit. And what always amazes me is that you, what you'll find when you see that is you'll see that an individual is doing something that they never did before when they didn't have God's life in them. Peter, for example. I mean, wow. Are you with me on Peter? Lord, I'll never deny you. No, Peter, you're going to do it not once, not twice, but man, you're going to do it three times. Three times you're going to do this. Lord, I'll never deny you. And he did. Why did Peter do that? Listen, because he cared more about Peter than he did Jesus. You need to take that statement and apply it to your own life. Peter was protecting his own hide. And that's where the majority of the so-called church stand today. We're protecting our own hide. But let me just tell you something about old Peter. Something radically changed in his life after the resurrection took place. People sit there and say, well, man, pastor, he's seen his hands. He's seen his side. He's seen all those things. But I'm telling you, the Bible emphasizes that that is not the way God chose to reveal himself. They saw it all, and they still didn't believe. You know how God revealed himself to them? He walked them through the scriptures and he opened their eyes and he gave them the ability to understand. I don't know about you, but that's very encouraging to somebody like me who didn't get the opportunity to stand there, see his hands, see his side, and see his feet. It tells me I got hope because praise God, he's given us his word and he says if we'll seek him, that as we seek him, he'll reveal himself to us and show us who he is, ladies and gentlemen. That's what he'll do. I mean, what an encouraging thought. Man, they saw it all, but that is not what did it for them. It was walking through the scriptures. It was God giving them the understanding of who he was and how it was all working and that all of this was really about Jesus and Jesus was standing right in front of them. So I'm not missing on anything because I wasn't there. Something changed in Peter's life. And he went from denying him to declaring him to the same people who put him on Calvary's cross. And what's interesting, in chapter 20, God breathed on them. They got the Spirit in 20. So the re when you get to chapter 2 in Acts, the Bible says that Peter 
was filled with the Spirit. So what I want to just kind of throw out is this, is that receiving the Spirit of God is different than the feeling, the feeling of the Spirit of God. I mean, when you get saved, you receive the Spirit of God. That's a one-time thing. But the filling of the Spirit is something that occurs over and over every moment, every day of our lives as we walk with Him. And all it is is just letting Him be in control. Letting Him be the one that influences us. Look at the analogy He uses. Don't be drunk with wine in which is excess or dissipation. I mean, now some of you sadly, and I'm sure ashamedly, in your past, you, you've messed around with alcohol. And when you messed around with alcohol, either you did or you've seen other people that when they get under the influence of alcohol, they begin to act in a manner that they would never act when they were sober. Anybody say yeah to that? <laughs> some of you have been there or some of you have seen it, right? It happens. What an unbelievable analogy. What an encouraging analogy. That ladies and gentlemen, if you'll be filled with the Spirit of God, if you'll let the Spirit of God control you and influence you, you will begin to see your life, have things happening in your life that you would have never seen when you were walking in the flesh and in your own power and your own resource. And that is it. No wonder God says that you are able to do exceedingly and abundantly more than you ask or think. Because listen, take this home. Put this in your bank. If I've got God inside of me, I can do anything God can do. But you know what? Instead of heeding the just shall live by faith, doggone it, the church is going to do it by sight. The, the, the church is going to make it work how it wants to make it work, and you wonder why the life of Jesus is not manifested. And I'm preaching to myself. Matt, you want to know why you're not seeing the life of Jesus manifested through you? It's because you want to do it your way. But let me just remind myself something and you something. It don't work our way. Without me, you can't do anything. But with me, whoa, you will bear much fruit. And by this, my Father in heaven will be glorified. That's it. I got more to say. Hey, th th there is really a whole lot more to say, but, but, but you know what? I, I really didn't intend to preach today to say, everybody get it. I know I talk fast. My greatest desire is to see people. And here's the, here's the invitation. When are the people of God going to say, Daddy, would you please show me how this thing works? Jesus didn't do it in a crowd. He, he didn't do it like this. He did it one-on-one. -on -one. He did it with his men. I'm telling you, I'm a guy that if you really want to know and you want to learn, I'll be glad to sit down with you and talk to you about it. And we'll learn together. We'll learn together. But that's what Jesus is looking for, people who want to lean in and say, I want to get it. I want to stop trying to make it work on my terms. And I really want to see your life manifested in me. That's really, for me, that's how I define Christianity. It is a continuation of the life of God through his people. That's what it is. And let me just tell you something. Jesus is building his church. And guess what? The church is exactly today where Jesus wants the church to be. We're not holding up the process, okay? He's working. He's going to continue to work because what he started, he's going to complete. I hope this excites you because it excites me. And it's true. Maybe you're here today, and honestly, I'm telling you, your greatest need, if you're not saved, is to be saved. Your greatest need, if you're not saved today, is to be saved. You say, well, I really don't know what that means. Well, let's sit down and talk about it. Amen? Let's talk about it.
But I know this, it's a gift. And the, way, the only way you're ever going to obtain it is to receive it by faith. I can tell you that. But Christians, when are we going to say, God, I want to learn. And you know what that means then. You realize what this means. If you say, God, I want to learn, that means you're going to have to sit down for a minute. And you're going to have to let him teach you. You have to sit down and let him teach you. Father, we thank you for another day. Lord, just another day for me. Lord, I, I know I've not always been where I am today. Lord, I've been all over the map, but Lord, you've never given up on me. You've never stopped pouring out grace. You've never stopped teaching me. You've never stopped putting people in my life to lead me and guide me in the way of truth. And Lord, I stand today as a free man. Sometimes don't necessarily know what to do, God, but thank you for clarifying it for me. Thank you for teaching me. And thank you for the desire to really build people and not just an institution for my own glory's sake. Lord, touch hearts, touch lives. Cause them to lean in. Cause them to reach out. Cause them to, to understand the need for humility. Lord, for the lost, only you can save. For the dead, only you can give life. Lord, I pray they see Jesus in all of his glory, in the glory of his finished work, in the glory of an empty tomb, in the glory of of his grace and invitation that invites men to come unto him and receive his life. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's stand together as we close with our invitation this morning.